With each issue of Sapir, we try to talk to uh, three or four, sometimes five uh, different uh, authors um, just for uh, the sake of uh, enriching the the conversations that we are that we are trying to have um, through Sapir through the Maimonides Fund, and you wrote um, a really superb, beautiful, I would say lapidary, um, very personal essay for our latest uh, our eighth issue of Sapir: um, uh, Judaism without borders, diaspora without uh, without tears. Um, uh, in a sub in a in a in a volume devoted to the subject of culture, and really the subject is you're talking about what it means to be a Jewish novelist in not just in the 21st century, but sort of in the um, following a, a period of a kind of a great efflorescence of the Jewish novel between you know Saul Bellow, Malamud, Roth, uh, a great many other people who kind of defined, almost defined the American, I mean, I, I didn't even mention Norman Mailer, defined the American novel, um, uh, and Cynthia Ozick, I, I, I can't not mention Cynthia, defined the American novel for, for almost uh, two generations. And now we're, you, you belong to the generation that comes after that. Your first novels were published really right after you were in college in the starting late eighties in the 19, in, in the 1990s. And so I wanna begin um, Allegra with an anecdote that you tell at the start of your essay, um, which is uh, going back 14 or 15 years, you were at a conference at um, the Radcliffe Institute in Cambridge, where the feminist literary critic Vivian Gornick was speaking on the subject of Jewish American uh, uh, literature. Um, and you you talk about an exchange that Gornick had with the historian uh, Stephen uh, uh, Zipperstein, and 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 the, the nature of of his question or comment was, uh, does Jewish American writing continue, um, and are others carrying on the torch? And then and then you capture Gornick saying, "No, sweetheart, you don't understand." <laughs> so so let's begin with with that point in in your story in your essay what is it that 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 Zipperstein didn't understand I think she was trying to make a point about a certain historical moment <laughs> and of course she's lecturing the historian Steve Zipperstein but um <laughs> she was trying to say that you know yes there may be Jewish writers now but the the, the flowering of American Jewish literature was really that they rep represented that and that moment is past and also that Jewish American fiction can never be mainstream and celebrated in the way that, in quite the way that those two writers were, Bellow and Roth. Um, they were both very Jewish and they were also just celebrated as great American novelists. You know, Bellow won the Nobel Prize, Roth Should wanted won to win Nobel the Nobel Prize. Prize, didn't really make it, but <laughs> won everything else. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so she was taking a very, um, kind of a narrow view. She wanted to make a very narrow point. Um, and I guess, you know, it all depends on how you define art and how you define reputation and how you define the evolution of artists. Um, you know, so she stuck to her guns. And and this traces your own um, your own evolution as 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 an artist. Um, you you, some of your earliest books, The Family Markovitz, Paradise Park, um, Catterskill Falls, I remember reading when, 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 when it came out, had really explicitly overtly Jewish themes, central Jewish, Jewish uh, uh, characters. Um, you, you just had uh, your, your most recent uh, novel, Sam, uh, a coming of age story about a young girl named Sam, uh, is, is um, by, by the way, it's getting rapturous reviews. I, I, you, you know you've hit the, the sweet spot when you get a, a, a gorgeous review in the Wall Street Journal and a gorgeous review in, in the New York Times. It's, uh, uh, <laughs> it's, it's uh, almost, almost miraculous. But in, <laughs> in Sam, there's really, the, the Jewishness is really off stage. And, mm -hmm. and it's been true of many of your more recent, much of your more recent work. In fact, you have a story which I read this morning in the New Yorker. Uh, which is a wonderful story, but unless 
unless I'm I'm missing something, it, it is really just about coming to terms with a divorce and and a, an ex husband moving on in 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 his life. Um, so you, you use this beautiful expression in your in your essay when you talk about how the Jewishness has become like almost a watermark on 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 the page. Expand a little more on that subject, on what it means to have a watermark of Jewishness in in your in your fiction, in your literature. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes it's still overt, and I'm still writing stories. Mostly, a lot of my short fiction is really very overtly Jewish in its content. And the story that you read, I can't believe you read it already. <laughs> just like it was talk the first about thing I read this morning. Hot off the internet, <laughs> it just came out. Um, um, that's part of a sequence which is, you know, really, really Jewish um, in its content. That particular story, not. Um, but in context, it is part of a book which I would say is very much a latter, a latter day family Markowitz. Um, so I, so my point is, I never stopped writing about Jewish people, Jewish themes, and all of those things. Um, you know, I was really interested in sort of expanding. Um, expanding my view and expanding my subject but I still think that you know there's there's always even in there's always some connection to Judaism in my work it's often not cultural and this sort of ties back with Vivian Gornick's point she is a secular Jew like a certain kind of feminist kind of New York secular Jew and she was very interested in Bello and Roth for their cultural Judaism, which was very strong in their work and made a huge impression at the time. And I think that um, cultural Judaism is not so much my subject, actually. I am interested even in those Jews who are not culturally Jewish, who may be far from the center, who may be very assimilated, who may be intermarried, who may be non-identifying as Jewish. Um, or is my character Sam's father says, you know, non-practicing that Sam doesn't even realize that he was Jewish until they have a conversation, you know, <laughs> um, an offhand conversation about it. About um, Hanukkah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I wanted so, to ask you about that because um so what when I mean it's really and, and you and you quote it in in um in your essay for for Sapir. Um how I mean it's it it's a it's it's a snippet of conversation. It it turns out to be a detail. How important was it for you to write those lines? How does it how does it inform your sense as an author of who Sam's father is? Uh, you because you talk about him elsewhere as a guy who always has is always telling lies about the future rather than 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 yeah. the past. And so you you sense in that in the larger context an identifiably Jewish character, kind of a Jewish loser, but for yeah. sure, a, a, a Jewish character. How much, how much of you was sort of infused in those lines, or, or, or do you go back and look at it and say, "Oh yeah, I just kind of stuck this in." No, no, I always thought of him as Jewish, and you know, I and as a Jewish writer, like I perceive a lot of my characters as also Jewish. But um, he is a Jew who's. I mean, he, you're right. He does have that kind of, um, kind of wandering, kind of happy, sad, bittersweet kind of. Um, artistic, you know, there there is a trope there <laughs> that is somewhat Jewish, but it's very much not at the it's it's not at the center of his identity that Sam knows, his daughter knows. It's not something that he transmits directly to her. It's very oblique, and that oblique connection to Judaism is something that I see in our community. And since I take the entire Jewish American community as my subject, that includes those people for whom Judaism is not the center of their lives. Um, Let me so. ask you about, uh, I want to uh, kind of um, talk a little bit more about your work, but I also want to talk about you in the context of writers roughly of your generation. And you and you mentioned a few of them, Michael Chabon, Jonathan Safran Foer, uh, Nathan Englander, Nicole Krauss, uh, Omar Friedlander, uh, Molly Ann Topol. To what extent do you sort of think of yourself as situated in that community, or is it just accidental? Well, <laughs> I think that writers, it's hard to say about artists are so individual and each of us has our own aesthetic and each of us has our own interests. So, you know, I think 
you know, I can name those names. I don't, it's not like we sit around the table <laughs> necessarily yes. and talk, but, but through our councils working, of the elders of Jewish novelists. Or... Yeah, that's not happening, <laughs> but, um, but we read each other and we're aware of each other. So, so in that way, we talk through our work, I guess, but I would say that each of us is different, you know, has different, um, different focus. And again, the subject is so big. Um, there, there are Jewish writers of my generation who are writing about the Holocaust and, or the effect of the Holocaust in really interesting ways. Um, there are writers who write um, sort of about, in, in much more personal ways, about their own you know, identities with, as, as Jews in more memoir, I should say, than fiction. Um, but it takes many different forms. Uh, so, so I guess, you know, I would say it's a very loose community. <laughs> no. um, and, and also in my essay, what I, I, what I didn't want to do was generalize about all of us because we're all so different. And if you had asked each of them, each of us to write an essay, it would have come out extremely different. I'm sure that their answers to these questions would have been very, very different from mine and from each other. Um, I'm, I'm just going to make a general note here uh, to, the, uh, to our audience that uh, as with all of our conversations, um, at about the 40 minute mark, uh, I'm going to start um, taking uh, taking questions and just posing them to you, Allegra. So if you have questions as they occur to you in the course of our conversation as Allegra is uh, speaking, put them. There's a Q&A function at the bottom of the uh, at the bottom of your Zoom bar. Um, so just put them in there and I will try to get to as many questions as I can, especially the ones that end with 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 question marks. Um, so just just bear that in mind as we um, as as we carry forward with with our uh, uh, conversation. I want to ask you, Allegra, just in a in a broad sense. You you have this wonderful line um, or series of lines in in your essay. You say American Judaism is rich. It is also impoverished. It is flourishing, and it is also uh, dying. Um, my, uh, you, you go on to say, my work is about Judaism and its specificity and its lingering traces. In some of my books, Judaism is overt on the page and others, it is barely invisible. And that beautiful line about the watermark. You also say in America, our community is deeply divided and at the same time resurgent with Jewish learning in day schools and adult education classes. This Renaissance seems to me a vital subject. We live in an age of assimilation, but also the age of Safaria. Um, so it's wonderful because you're capturing really in, in, in such a succinct way the paradoxes of Jewish life, uh, artistic life in particular, um, uh, in, 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 this day, uh, in this day and age. So how do, you, how do you manage to, how does an artist manage to capture that kind of uh, duality about Jewish life today, or what? What? How do you? What are the mechanisms by which you explore both that mm -hmm. kind of richness and that impoverishment? I think, as somebody who writes fiction, I explore it by dramatizing it. So, for example, another um, story in the same cycle as the one that you read this morning um, is called Apple Cake, and in that story, um, the matriarch of the family dies. And they've all been, she's been in hospice for a really long time. And it gets to the point where nobody can stay any longer. So they have Shiva for one day, <laughs> you know, Shiva by definition, which is seven days is one day. And like, and, you know, to me, so that is one way of, without saying it, showing it as fiction writers do, you know, that they're very, they're Jewish. They, this is a Jewish family and they want to sit Shiva and honor her memory. And at the same time, they have no time. And. So they alter the tradition. That's one way. You know, it's it's sad. It's funny. It's some would say ignorant. You know, um, and so showing those paradoxes, and also because I do, because I write many stories and many different kinds of books, I look at things from different angles. And taking those different perspectives and different points of view, I'm able to um, capture some of that, uh, some of those contrasts and paradoxes that I describe in in the essay. One of the ways in which your perspective shifts um, is is geographic, um, uh, and and I want to ask you about this because you know you were born in Brooklyn, moved to Hawaii when you were a very uh, baby, I guess. Yeah, too. Uh, yeah. Grew up there, went to 
was it the same high school that Barack Obama? Um, yeah, I went to Punahou, which is where he Punahou, the, the, the prestigious high school in, in uh, I guess, Honolulu, right? Yep. Uh, and then and then moved back to the States and you now live in Cambridge. What does the change in, how, how have these changes in geographic perspective affected your, your writing and your understanding of your characters? Well, as somebody who grew up in Hawaii, I really did grow up on the edge of <laughs> the American Jewish community. You know, sort of like what Vivian Gornick was describing, like I was way west of that, yeah. <laughs> you know, like 13 hours by plane west. Um, so as I described in the essay, I didn't have a lot of experience with institutional Judaism um, growing up. And it wasn't until I moved to the mainland, as we call it, um, you know, that I, that I knew what a JCC was, that I saw what a Jewish, you know, what, what a thriving Jewish youth group might be. I didn't have an option to go to a day school in, you know, my school Punahou was founded by Christian missionaries in the 19th century. So I went to a Christian school, um, you know, so all of that, and, and again, and, and within the United States, is, it, it, within the mainland United States, continental, there are places that are also removed from the sort of institutional Judaism of like Los Angeles or New York. Um, but it gave me a different perspective on things. I did spend time in New York in the summers which, and especially in the Catskills, which is where I got um, the memories and experience that I drew upon in my novel, Catterskill Falls. Yep. Um, so I was a bit of a participant observer, but I was also an outsider coming from way left field. Um, Did you feel, I, well, just a quick question, when you were growing up in Hawaii, your, your understanding, I mean, obviously you must've gone back to, to the mainland for vacations and, and, and so on, but to what extent did, you know, the, the Philip Roth uh, or the Bernard Malamud or whoever, the, the, the novelistic view of American Jewry influence your perception of what that community was about? Really very little. I mean, yeah. I wasn't reading them when I was growing up. My dad liked Saul Bellow and I remember he had his novels, you know, and um, the kind of stuff that I was, I was interested in becoming a poet in college, I studied 17th century English poetry. Like I was, I was not as clued in and tuned in as um, one might think. <laughs> I I was interested in Shalom Aleichem when I was young, and his kind of bittersweet ethos and his work really attracted me. Um, but you know, but these other people, I I didn't understand as much and didn't read as much. The one that really I was very interested in was Cynthia Ozick who you mm -hmm. mentioned, and she is their contemporary. And um, I liked her, the layers of her work. I liked her style, but I was also really interested because in her because she's interested in spiritual Judaism. She is interested in that facet that goes beyond culture. And, that, and very early on, I was attracted to that. And that remains true of me today. That again, it's not cultural Judaism and institutional Judaism, which is ephemeral in my opinion, and can change, but it's liturgy that really interests me. It's religion that interests me, uh, religion in all its different forms and, um, and spirituality. And that's what I found in her work. Let me ask you about this, especially about your early work, because you really start, I, mean, I think you started writing when you were a child. Uh, and I think yeah. your first published story was when you were 17 or some, yeah. <laughs> some very, very precocious age. Um, and and if I remember, I haven't read the story, but if I remember that first story of yours about cattle, um, and also much cattle, <laughs> yes, was was conceived in 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 explicitly Jewish terms. To what extent was that really a very self conscious choice that you thought of yourself as a young woman coming of age as a soon to be Jewish novelist, or or did you was that just the material that was at hand? Well, it was a little of both. I don't think. I would have, yeah, I wanted to be a novelist. I wanted to write plays. I wanted to write poetry. I just wanted to be a writer of some sort. Yeah. And what, the, it was the material at hand because I was living in Honolulu at the time and it was pretty crazy Jewishly. And I was, my connection with Judaism was liturgical. I was in shul with my parents. It was in the service and young rabbis did come out and lead the service. And yeah, and um, so I was, I was writing what I knew, as they always advise young writers to do, 
But I was also very interested even then in sort of intertextuality and the contrast between the grand liturgy of the Yom Kippur service and the squabbles of the people there, uh, the, the people in the minion, essentially. Those contrasts and those, that humor was what drew me and what was alive for me. And, that, and um, I took that forward. When you were when you were reading the Bello and the other great Jewish novelists as um, a younger writer, this is a question I always have because it, it it informs my own writing. I assume you sometimes go back and read them again. Uh, is that right? <laughs> no? I, I wish I could say yes. I'll be honest. I I have not reread a lot of them. I what struck me about Bello and Roth. I like their energy. I like the power of their work. Yeah. Um, I would say that that very really as a young novelist, I was, and as a child, the writers who obsessed me were like Victorian novelists. I was really interested in Dickens and Austin, and, I, and earlier than that, Austin. I was interested in, in um, George Eliot. Daniel Deronda. Daniel Deronda, which is my favorite Jewish book. Mm -hmm. And although not written by a Jewish person, Middlemarch. The, if you look at Catterskill Falls, which is my first novel, which I wrote when I was very young and I started when I was about 20, um, you can see the stuff that I was reading that, you know, that is my Middlemarch. That is my, you know, my Daniel Deronda and my Middlemarch. I was sort of like, what if I could write about a community the way she wrote about Middlemarch, only my community was Jewish? What if I could write about, you know, what, what if I could have this scene where everybody comes together only in Trollope, it's a fox hunt, but in my book, it will be a synagogue. You know, what if I could write about the succession of, of you know, from, of the son to the father and the schism within the family and the community, but in mine, it's a rabbi, you know? So I was thinking in those terms, those were the people that really excited me. And so for me, actually, me living on the periphery of institutional Judaism, Saul and Saul Bellow and Philip Roth were on the periphery of my literary imagination. Yeah, that's it's a fascinating. I mean, I'm always interested in 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 early reading, and in my case, I'm now in a phase when I'm rereading some of the things that meant a lot to me when I was younger, and then finding myself either seeing more than I did at the time, but sometimes just being disappointed in what, yeah. in, in some of the literature. That I that I loved when I was twenty, and now seems sort of either dated or overwrought. Sure. You know, when I'm, when I'm pushing fifty, uh, which is a very different experience. But I want to talk more, a little bit about your evolution as 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 a writer, because um, something seems to change at the turn of the century um, when you're, uh, without giving too much away, your early thirties. Uh, you know, there's a, Dante wrote the Divine Comedy with uh, ending Paradiso. He, I think he wrote it at 35. He talks about the middle of uh, his own journey, beginning in the middle of a dark wood, um, roughly at the same age that you published Paradise Park, which is a quest for God beyond Judaism via the Pentecostal church and studying religion, <laughs> but then doubling back towards uh, Judaism. So this may be a somewhat overwrought question, but um, you, you did publish a story called La Vita Nuova in, in, in the New Yorker in, in 2010. Mm -hmm. So what, what, was, was there like a, a moment of transition that you felt a self-conscious moment of transition in your own literary journey? Had you just phased out of something or, or what happened? I mean, I, I always, I think of sort of every project as a kind of a new transition. So I, I don't, um, you know, even before I published La Vita Nuova, I'd written this book about scientists. And, you know, I, I, I've written about all these different sorts of people and really experimented with different styles. I think that story, La Vita Nuova, which is one of the stories that people love the most that I've written, um, was a departure for me in terms of style, for sure in that I was experimenting with this very um, pared down writing in that story. It was sort of much more minimalist. I was, but it's all connect, it's still connected. You know, it's still very intertextual, just like my first story and also much cattle, only here it's Dante instead of uh, the, you know, the Hebrew liturgy. Um, 
so, you know, I think that some people, as I've mentioned in the essay, think that I've, again, written less and less and less about, you know, Jewish subjects. In my, you know, I think it all depends on what part of my work you're looking at, and I've still continued. Um, and, you know, again, I, like, as you said, take a small Catholic C, and I'm very curious. Um, so I like I to experiment. To, I want to talk about your new novel, Sam, mm -hmm. because there, too, you are... I don't know if it's a stylistic departure, but it's 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 clearly you've given a lot of thought to the way in which you choose your voice. Um, and you trace the story of a, a coming of age story of a girl. It begins when she's, what, seven? Her yeah. little brother is two. Yeah. Um, and it it has that kind of very pared down voice that you would expect from the mind of a seven-year-old uh, kid. And then it develops over the next 10 years of her of her of her life, her kind of her her her, um, her coming of age. So uh, I'm here, I'm just this is not even Jewish a Jewish question. It's just a writerly question. How did you make those decisions about how to inflect the voices of your characters and and the way in which you choose to 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 manage your prose? That's a great question. I think that um, the way I would describe it is. I think of writing, and this is true of all my writing, my Jewish, my more Jewish fiction, they're, it's all Jewish, whatever. I think of it as performance. So I was performing this character. So I started by with the voice that you would enact somebody who was seven and I grew her <laughs> from the inside by knowing her really well and knowing what she would say. And voice is really important in all of my work, whether it's dialogue or whether it's using that very intimate third person that I use in Sam where you're you know, up really close and you can see her perception and you can also see her perception changing. Um, so, so I would describe it as a performance and just uh, a performance based on knowledge. So that if you know the character, if, if, you, if you know the people well enough, you will know exactly what words they will use at, in different occasions. There was a moment in Catterskill Falls where I sort of discovered that as a young writer. I was writing a scene where Isaac Shulman goes to see the famous rabbi, you know, and he's he's worried and nervous about asking him a favor or question on behalf of his wife. And then the rabbi says to him, the words that mean the most to him, he says, I remember your father. And it's sort of like, I just knew that the rabbi would say that at that time. And I knew that that would mean the most to Isaac because I knew the characters. And that's the kind of, that's what I aspire to, that just knowing them well enough so that like, as with jazz, you know, you, you, the, the, the instruments will talk to each other. The conversation will happen. Another aspect of your writing that interests me is, I mean, you really are, you're, you're just interested in your characters and you're interested in a very rich variety of characters and you're interested in the characters for, you know, fundamental human experiences. Um, you are not a, from what, I mean, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, you're not a polemical writer. You are not peddling, uh, 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 a politics or any kind of ideology. People are just rich and complicated in in your stories, and and I want to get your sense of what what your views are about that kind of polemical novelistic fiction. Mm -hmm. Whether what attitude you take toward it. is it just not for you, or do you oppose it? Um, what's your What's your sense of the role it should play in the ecosystem of our, you know, of our literary imagination? That's a really good question. It's definitely not for me. I, in, in terms of my work, I think it kills. I think it kills the, it kills the life. It, you know, somebody said to me in an interview, um, so what is a lesson you want people to take away from Sam? And I said, well, if I wanted to teach a lesson, if I, I would have taught a class, you know? I, I, it's like, why do you write fiction? If you want to make a point about politics or polemics, then write an essay, in my opinion. Write an op-ed. Um, there's, you know, that's a perfectly honorable genre. <laughs> um, and you can make your point more directly. Why? So if you're going to write fiction, then what can fiction offer? What can I offer? I can offer intimacy. I can offer complexity. And I can offer ambiguity. And the ambiguity is... Um, is contrary to the designs of polemic. So those things don't work. Now, is it possible to write a polemical novel and it still be great work? I mean, I love Steinbeck, you know? I think Grapes of Wrath is a 
an amazing book. I would say that's a pretty polemical book in a lot of ways, but it's still a great novel. And um, Bella wrote polemical so, books too. Sure. I mean, in some ways, Mr. Sandler's Planet is a polemical mm -hmm. book. Yep. So it's, I think it can be done. It's it, my work is sort of all in the wrist. I I'm interested in lightness. I'm my aesthetic has to do um, with not beating people over the head. I'd rather tickle. <laughs> do you think when you when you talk about? I mean, I don't want to ask you to cast aspersions or make judgments, but when when a novelist enters the political uh, fray, that's that's always a kind of a fraught. Um, uh, moment. Um, and do you think there ought to be, I think about this in particular in terms of the Jewish question, there ought to be rules around that. I mean, Michael Chabon is someone I think about, you know, who has sort of been pretty outspoken on on, on Jewish issues. And it, of course, it's it's touched deeply on his, you know, in, in terms of his, his fictional, uh, uh, uni you know, the universe that he's, that, that, that he's created. But a Jewish novelist goes and makes a statement about, um, I don't know, Israeli politics or the state mm -hmm. of the diaspora or anti-Semitism, one thing. Mm -hmm. Are there particular, in your view, particular responsibilities to speaking as a Jewish novelist, especially when you're speaking about something other than your characters? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sort of gets into the that nexus between being an artist and being a public figure. I guess I'm much more on the side of being an artist and I don't feel quite famous enough to be a public figure. But I think that I think that artists who see injustice or artists who um, perceive, you know, a problem, they have every right to speak, um, use their name. I just don't I, I don't think it necessarily serves their art. It might serve a point, <laughs> a political point. Um, but I, I'm not sure it. Um, it will serve them well. Also, and, and you know, one of the things I touch upon, and if we're going to, you know, bring up Israel, I'm really interested in writing about Israel that is art. And I think that the Israeli novelists are doing that while the American novelists are more, are doing a bit more grandstanding <laughs> that, you know, because we are on the outside looking in perhaps, you know, um, I, I, I'm interested in sort of that much more personal, much more intimate look at a country um, have you ever been tempted to head on over and uh, I've been to Israel many no, times I mean, but to, to oh. head on over for the purpose of, of writing a oh yeah um I don't know if I'd be good at it I you know I, it would have to be the right I, I, I have to figure it out um I think that also Americans should have a lot of humility writing about you know a country that we don't serve in the military and vote and <laughs> you know I, I wouldn't want to legislate Israeli politics from over here. And I also wouldn't want to um, sort of do my, it would be very much an American perspective on Israel. Let so I have to see what I have to contribute. Well, you, you raise something that's sort of interesting because it's um, a little bit in, it has to do with the sort of the literary temper of the times, which is the idea that you should stay in your lane as a, as a, as a Jewish writer or a, a Irish or black writer, you know, that, that you, you have to be very, very um, careful about writing about other cultures, other experiences, having characters who more or less resemble your own demographic. And this has become, um, I think, ubiquitous in, in the publishing industry. There's, mm -hmm. my sense is that there's a lot of nervousness and fear around some of these cultural um, hot button issues. Some novelists, friends of mine, a former guest on this pod, on this little uh, podcast, the Lionel Shriver, whom you, you've probably read, has has been. I know her. Yeah, <laughs> uh, she's a friend of mine of many many years, um, and she has been absolutely outspoken. And she really uh, has a very polemical side to her, and yeah. is, is is doing a lot of political writing in addition to her her fiction. But how are these? ideological or political um, movements, ideas um, impinging on the right on, on on the life of writers. I mean, mm -hmm. do you see it in either in your own experience or in the writers that you know that there's a kind of a more diffidence in terms of their writing, a certain kind of fearfulness or 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 not? Yeah, I think that you, I mean, there 
that is all happening. <laughs> I think that um, there's a tension. On the one hand, writers want to feel like that they can use their imagination and, and you know, inhabit any world or any person. On the other hand, there's a feeling, there's a worry about cultural appropriation or take, ventriloquizing the voice of somebody that they don't have no right to ventriloquize, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, you know, and 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 that that is tricky. Um, you know, I think it's interesting also that people are selective sometimes in the in the criticisms of writers who do this. Um, you know, Philip Roth, I think, did a terrible job writing about women, for example, or writing about from women's points of view. <laughs> so that may be a case where I don't think he could he was really able to fully inhabit, you know, inhabit that. You know, I I I do on the one hand want to feel that I can that I have a broad canvas that I can that I can explore where my curiosity takes me. And I don't want to just write about myself and my own limited experience. Um, and on the other hand, I think you do need a certain amount of humility. I, I'm thinking, for example, of the Holocaust. Like, I don't think I would ever write a book uh, or even a story that was set in the, you know, in the period of the Holocaust. I just don't feel that I have earned that privilege or that I have suffered directly. Um, so I wouldn't take that on to give an example. On the other hand, I think there's another extreme where you say like you can only write about yourself and your own culture and your own people and that sort of thing, which is very limited and can be very pernicious. Um, you know, so, so it's complicated. But do you sense that the publishing world has changed dramatically in the last 10 or 15 years? Is there, is it a new, a new dispensation? I mean, this is, I feel like we've gone through the equivalent of the 1960s, culturally speaking, and like an abrupt revolution in sensibilities. The only difference is that in the 1960s, people changed their clothes to kind of indicate the change. And now everyone more or less dresses the same as they did 20 years ago. Um, but there's been that sudden, sudden shift or, or, or do you not, do you not encounter and experience that? I think, I think to me, the more dangerous shift, honestly, is that people aren't reading at all. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, you know, we live in such a distracted age that people aren't reading. So that for me is the, the biggest shift and sort of the and and also just sort of the biggest shift is technological rather than ideological and cultural. I think that those trends that you're talking about, and you know, and, and you're right, there is the sort of cancel culture that's going on. There is a desire for um, new, but the desire for new voices, I think, was there before. Um, uh, you know, so so I think it's a distraction more than anything. Now you could say also that means that there are fewer and there there's a smaller audience so that you know people have to compete for that smaller audience and then who gets who is it that gets you know the spotlight that no, maybe well, more of a culture of scarcity is, I think about that all the time um uh just looking at young people and I mean when I was a kid I always had a book, you know, I just, mm -hmm. it's one yeah, of those now things. Now they have their phone in front of them. And now time. my kids are, well, my kids are readers, but um, mm -hmm. I think we're a bit of a special case. And even then it's most of the time is, is uh, some engagement with their phones or, or, or social media. And it's led, I worry that it's led to this gigantic hollowing out of our inner lives. Mm -hmm. That, that something has been like just a giant vacuum has been taken to our souls uh, mm -hmm. and placed placed in these phones. And so that the opportunities for really great literature are shrinking mm. just, just because there isn't a sounding board within so many potential readers. They're just not, yes. never yes. mind that they don't even, they're not even, don't even have the patience to sit down for 300 pages and read. But if, even if they did, it wouldn't resonate because, because their inner life has been so denuded by everything that has been digitalized and, and externalized. And I sure I sort of freak people out have studied about that. that sort of lack of attention. Like, yeah. you know, who has who's going to sit down with a 700 page novel right now? <laughs> you know, I would say so. I see that that is very real what you're describing. I would if we were going to be like slightly optimistic, we could also say, well, there's a couple of things you could say. 
I think that in the old days, you know, like if you go back to like the 19th century or the early 19th century, novels were considered to be the phones. You know, they, they were considered to be mindless, frivolous. You know, you're just going to rot your brain. No novels were like what what television was when our parents worried about us, right? Um, and now, you know, people, now somebody's, you know, 12-year-old daughter is reading this like horrible pornographic vampire story and they're like, you're, people, the parents are like, oh, she's reading a book. How wonderful. You know, they, they're really excited. So, you know, so what does this do to people who write serious fiction? It's sort of liberating, right? So the people that we write for are maybe fit audience, so few, and we don't have to maybe write, we don't have to be as commercial perhaps. So that's one way of looking at it. If you look at a writer like Dickens or Mark Twain, very commercial writers, like they were incredibly popular. They also wrote some great, some really great work, but they had to write all this other stuff, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of words. Maybe we get to write less <laughs> because television and TikTok are taking care of the mindlessness, the mindless <laughs> part of it. So that's, so that's maybe one contrarian way of looking at it, but I do see what you're saying and it's very real. People don't read in the same way. Perhaps people maybe appreciate unplugging better than when they actually do get in the zone and they do read a book. Maybe that's more magical. Maybe it's more special now. So again, I see both sides. Let me ask you one final question from my side before I turn it over to the audiences. And this is an institutional question, uh, genuinely seeking advice, because um, we started Sapir two years ago and, and we're where the, the, the subtitle of Sapir is Ideas for a Thriving Jewish Future. So Sapir aims to be a journal that not only thoughtfully considers important issues facing the Jewish community, but also offers prescriptive ideas. And, and in that spirit, um, should we be doing more to further Jewish American writing in the 21st century? Are there, what are the virtues and pitfalls of, of philanthropic efforts to foster or encourage or create more art with um, at least semi-explicit Jewish themes? Mm. Well, that's such a good question. Well, you know, I, I'll answer from personal experience. I got my start publishing fiction in commentary, which is, you know, an old, an old Jewish periodical, much older than Sapir, which is interested in politics and somewhat in culture. And I was writing stories with Jewish themes. And when I was 17, that's the magazine that I sent my work to. And they, and that's how I got my start. Um, you, you'll perhaps, be pleased to know that when I was 19, <laughs> I wrote on a lark a, 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 a book review, which I showed to my father and he said, you should send this to commentary. And that's how I got my start. There you go, you in, see. In, in writing as well, sorry. So, I it may be, it, so my point is maybe it's, maybe it's in terms of finding an actual platform for the writer's voices in their fiction, in their conversations, in, in the things that you're doing. But, um, but again, you know, I couldn't have, I couldn't have started by writing at the New Yorker, <laughs> but after I had written a commentary and published a book, I ended up writing for the New Yorker. So, you know, there's, there's, I think there's definitely a place for that. And I think always, I guess, and maybe this is just because I'm a maverick, you know, independent, self-employed, independent artist, but um, I think of it as I, institutionally, I'm always interested in like direct help to direct help and direct platforms for the individual rather than um, global global efforts to other institutions. Let me turn it over to some of the questions that are coming from our audience. Um, Sarah Siegel asks, ever since the second temple was destroyed, haven't we always been in the desert and the promised land at once um, as Jews? What makes now different other than safaria.org? <laughs> I think that's great. Yeah. And, you know, if, and if you read the prophets, <laughs> which I think um, the other essay about culture references <laughs> in this issue, um, you know, it's always sort of like, you know, it, it, everything's going to hell <laughs> and, you know, you're all going to die and, you, you know, your behavior is, go is going to alienate you forever and you're going to, you know, burn up like cinders and also you'll be redeemed and also you will come into the land. So both of those narratives, um, definitely coexist sometimes within the same prophecy. Uh, Mark, uh, 
Neubauer, Neubauer. Um, Mark, uh, you're watching this, and I'm sorry, I've just uh, mangled your surname. Uh, just asks a simple but very useful question. Allegra, who are your Jewish mentor mentor authors, if any? I think probably the two most important to me growing up were Shoah Malechem and Cynthia Ozick. And you mentioned, you explained a little bit about your why Cynthia was so influential. What about Alechem? I think really it was it was his bittersweetness, his his humor and sadness at the same time. His work to me, his stories were like laughter through tears. I love that. I, I love the way he did that. He had a delicacy that I didn't find, for example, in Ivy Singer. Um, let's see. Um... Elliot Wilner asks, um, there are people who are Jewish, whether religiously, culturally, or politically, out, either out of conviction or out of um, habit. It is those Jews, creatures of habit, who are a dying demographic. Yes, I guess. <laughs> it's sort of a question That's that interesting. In itself, but- um, I guess it depends what, you know, it depends how strong their habits are or what their habits are based on. One of my, one of my earliest characters in my first published story was a, Orthodox Jew who doesn't believe in God. He's really just interested in being Orthodox out of habit. He likes ritual. He likes doing it for its own sake. And I was really interested in exploring that paradox and what happens to somebody like that. I want to ask you, actually, this is, gets back to pieces of our earlier conversation. You know, you talk about the kind of the watermark stain, um, the, the the tiny, almost atavistic uh, um, memory of a Jewish uh, connection. Um, does it fade entirely at some point? Um, is there at some point where they're just, you're just not, we just won't be writing about Jews or you won't be writing about Jews? I mean, it's, it's you've, you, you paint expansively and you say correctly, you consider assimilated Jews, Jew, every bit as much Jewish as, as, as Orthodox mm -hmm. Jews, I think very much correctly, but is there, a line where it just ceases to be Jewish in any way. So there may be, there may not be Jewish people in the story or in the book, but there may be Jewish texts in there in, in terms of my work. Um, so I don't think it will ever fade away completely. You might just need to shine a light on it, you know, <laughs> a special light to be able to see it. Um, let's see, another anonymous uh, attendee says, one of the questions in this issue of Sapir was the appropriate role of Jewish philanthropy, which we talked about a little bit just now. Do you think people who fund culture or the arts can promote a view and try to influence an artist or do they just need to empower and get out of the way? <laughs> well, I think that philanthropists can promote a view and have some influence by what they choose or who they would choose to fund. But I think at that point, but there's no way they can control, you know, what, what happens after that. And I think that the best philanthropy probably involves having no strings attached and getting out of the, letting the, letting the work develop. I, I do believe that. Um, another question, you've reflected a little bit on the state of reading and publishing, but what about the state of Jewish books in particular? You're speaking to an audience who might have the ability to shape the world of Jewish books in one way or another, publishing distribution, or the encouragement of writing in specific veins or genres. If you were a philanthropist with a billion dollars, <laughs> nice to imagine, um, who cared about this, what would you do? Jewish books. Um, probably what I would do if I had a billion dollars, I'd probably donate it all to Jewish day schools who could promote um, Jewish literacy and learning. Because without that, that, that has to come before the books, <laughs> you know, those, those kids will then grow up to be the writers and the readers and carry on the culture. I would donate it to teachers. I would donate it to study of Hebrew language and, and Jewish history and philosophy. It's an excellent, it's an excellent answer. Um, uh, let me just close out by asking you, what are you, tell us about what you're doing next. So I have you must be going on a book tour, among other things. <laughs> yeah, I've done a fair amount of that. <laughs> and I am um, I am revising a new novel. And okay, fair warning to everybody here, and I don't usually talk about my stuff until it's published, but 
there are no Jewish characters in the book, but there is one Jewish character and it is a, a Jewish book. The book is the character that the Jewish connection in this novel. And the novel is very much about religion and spirituality and somebody who gets tested very severely. So that is that novel. And then I also, at the same time, wrote a book of short stories, which I'm finishing, and which the story that came out today is part of. And that one is really overtly Jewish. I've always wanted to write like a Latter-day fa Family Markowitz about a contemporary Jewish-American family. And that, that, you know, book of short stories, there's a story about a bat mitzvah. There's a story about a bris. You know, it's hard to find a good story about a bris. There's a story about a family sit sitting shiva. There is a, a, a Yom Kippur story set in a Yom Kippur service not in Hawaii, but a different kind of Yom Kippur service. There's a story about a Seder. Um, so it has, it, that book really sort of delves into some of the Jewish, the milestones of Jewish life and the uh, marks on the Jewish calendar. And I'm excited about that one too. That's probably and, coming out after the novel. And your New Yorker story that didn't, at least to me, appear to have it overtly is Deborah, Richard, are these Jewish characters? Yeah, they're all Jewish. Yes, they're part of this Jewish family. And this becomes apparent in the fuller, Scope yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the little girl Lily, who's their daughter, the story about the bat mitzvah is her bat mitzvah, and um, and Heather, the second wife, who gets married to, to uh, Richard, she is a Jewish communal leader. So, but it's not in this particular story. But all of these things are unfolded in in the book. So it is that is quite. Uh, and I've been working really steadily on this whole project this whole time. So I always feel like, but wait, I am writing you know Jewish fiction the whole time. <laughs> So what it, I, I'll just close out by by just saying a couple of things. Um, I read Catterskill Falls, I think when I was a couple of years out of college and was actually, for personal reasons, going up to Bearsville and Woodstock and the area around Catterskill Falls um, uh, quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And so when it, when it came out, um, I, I obviously read it and it made a profound impression um, on me, both for 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 two reasons. One was it was just a, it's a wonderful novel. It's a wonderful story, but it also gave me the sense right after college that you know, you're a little bit older than I am, but not that much older than I am. That this writer's life was possible, uh, and obviously I've done it in a much more polemical um, vein, um, uh, and and I would never dare to try my hand at fiction, but. It made a, a, huge, a real difference in my life to have you as a role model, and I think as a Jewish role model, maybe also because you were writing in commentary, irrespective of the fact that my ambitions weren't novelistic, they were they were writerly. So I've I've never met you before, but I've always wanted to thank you for, oh. in some ways, um, putting me on my way as uh, as a writer because I thought, well. It's it's doable, um, and and that that I don't know how large of an influence it was, but it was a real influence. It made a great difference in in my own life. So this is a public opportunity uh, to thank you. I also want to just say a few words about our our audience, um, the Sapir audience. Um, it may be a remnant, but it it's maybe it's a saving remnant um, of people who care profoundly about. Um, all the aspects of Jewish life, not just um, political or historical um, or ideological, but also artistic and, and cultural. And when we talk about ideas for a thriving Jewish future, it's hard to imagine a thriving Jewish future without thriving Jewish novelists, whether they're writing about Jews um, or, or not. That's the ecosystem that we are trying to create with Sapir through the good offices of the Maimonides Fund and my, my wonderful colleagues at, at, at Sapir, my, my managing editor, Saul Rosenberg, Felicia, uh, Felicia Herman, Ariel Saperstein, Mark Cherendoff, the people who support Sapir. So I just wanna thank you because what we're trying to do is create a community of people who really believe that this matters, um, uh, not only matters for the way in which we enjoy our life or experience our Judaism, but matters for the way in which we um, enrich the culture at large. And you've done so much to further that, um, Allegra. So it's it's an absolute honor to spend um, an hour with you. I'm at, I'm at, if someone didn't get it, I'm at Gillette Stadium, uh, improbably in Foxborough, Massachusetts. 
Um, usually rooting for the Seahawks, but today I guess we're all patriots on President's Day. So thank you very much for joining me for the last hour. And I want to thank the audience for, for participating in these, in these conversations. There are many more to come.